Um, before we start, the, I believe we've received uh, a few awards uh, on behalf of uh, Renewable Energy Awards. Craig, as the chair of the Housing Subcommittee, received these awards on behalf of the council, so I'll let him say a few words about it. Thank you, Leader. Um, yes, on behalf of uh, Dumfries and Galloway Council, uh, Chris Wood G and myself attended an award ceremony up in Edinburgh recently um, to do with Community Energy Scotland and Renew Renewable Energy Awards. Um, at that particular evening, I'm pleased to announce that uh, Dumfries and Galloway received a number of awards for its work in uh, community energy and, um, and energy efficiency. Uh, I have four different certificates here, Leader. Um, I'll just briefly go through them so members, and I'll leave them on the side for members to have a look at, and hopefully with members' permission, we'll have these displayed in either the members' lounge or in the, the public hall there so, so the public can take a look at these as well and see the work that Dumfries and Galloway Council is doing towards it. Um, we received one, we have two awards received from Europe, uh, which is uh, the Renewable Energy Sources, which is a European-wide body, and we have a certificate here in recognition of Dumfries and Galloway as a 100% renewable energy source community. We have uh, another one received in Brussels for the Renewable Energy Champions League Award 2014 in the category Medium Cities, and it's a third place award to which we have a certificate and we have this trophy here that has been awarded to us, and that was picked up on our behalf in Brussels. And up in Edinburgh, at the particular awards ceremonies, which was the Scottish National Renewables Energy League. Uh, we, we, there's two sections to that, uh, Leader. There is a, a one for um, regions, and all 32 <laughs> local authorities of Scotland take part in these awards, and this is the first time that all 32 local authorities have been involved. Um, and it's split into two categories. It's 150,000 population above or below. And uh, Dumfries and Galloway, we were the league champions in the heat pump technology. And that is for our work, along with other partners throughout the region, of uh, heat, heat pumps uh, um, related to a lot of work that is done by DGHP on behalf of their properties and, and other partners that we have throughout the region. So we were league champions in that particular category and also we became, the Dumfries and Galloway became the league champions 2014 for the solar photovoltaic. And that is for work throughout, not just what the, the systems that the council is installing, but uh, through partners throughout the region, again, with the work that, that they are putting in so, uh, so, solar photovoltaic systems. Um, biomass leader is another energy efficiency form that is being implemented throughout the region, a lot in some of the farms around the region that we have, and that is all contributing towards, towards the energy efficiency. Um, and also energy efficiency measures through the HEAPS Apps program that the council operate through the, the housing subcommittee. Uh, and I'm pleased to announce that a further 1.7 million pounds of investment has been granted from Scottish Government for Dumfries and Gall Galloway Council to invest in that program next year and that will help to mitigate the fuel poverty that we have across our region. Thank you very much for that. I think uh, congratulations goes to everybody, every staff member that's uh, contributed to that, as well as, you know, I think we should congratulate ourselves as well for uh, giving direction to that. Okay. Um, right. Welcome and good morning. Can I welcome everyone to what I'm sure you won't be disappointed to know is the last meeting of 2014. I think it's fair to say the past year has been one of change for the Council. But as we head towards 2015, that pace of change will increase. In recent months, we've adopted a far more focused set of priorities and, and commitments. And today we will consider a report of how these will be measured and embedded into our business plans. We have put in place the process to develop our region's first ever anti-poverty strategy, including holding our successful conference in October. We are now on course to establish a multi-service uh, action group under the direction of Chief Executive and my leadership, which will drive forward 
the development and implementation of that strategy. During the past few months, we've faced a difficult challenge with the Integrated Children's Service Inspection, but I'm pleased to say that the inspectors visited Dumfries and Galloway last week to review our progress in implementing the improvement plan, and the initial feedback is very, very positive. In recent months, we've also adopted the recommendation from the Chief Executive to reshape our council. Today, we'll have the opportunity to discuss how the plans will be taken forward to ensure the council is a fit for purpose sustainable organisation, which will meet the major challenges facing local government for the next five years and deliver on our council priorities. Earlier this year, we agreed to change the way we set the council's budget and today we will see the release of one, maybe more, uh, draft budgets that for the first time will bring our capital and revenue budgets together and deliver a medium to long-term direction of travel for our council finances. So today may be the last meeting of 2014, but it's one that will set the agenda for our council for many years to come. Could I have uh, any apol apologies? Thank you, Leader. Uh, I have two apologies from Councillors Gilroy and Wiper. There are 45 members present. Thank you. Any declarations of interest? Brian? Thank you, Leader. I uh, would just declare an interest in item 9, but I intend remaining in the Chamber and taking part in any debate around that item. Thank you. Anyone else? Dennis? Yeah, thanks to your item for page 29, retendering of local bus services. I am on the Swiss Trans Board, but if there's no discussion here, I plan to stay in the chamber, but I'm, I'm, I'm on the board, so I will declare that as an interest. Okay. Marianne? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm the same as um, Councillor Mail. <coughs> I'm on the Swiss Trans um, Board. Councillor McCorty? Similar. Similar. No one else? No. Can we move on to the minute of meeting, the 25th of September 2014? I'm happy to move. Happy to second. Okay. Jim? Yeah, thanks, Leader. I'm challenging the accuracy of the minutes under item 5. Uh, regarding the appointment of senior councillors, my reason for the challenge is at no time during your speech did you indicate when nominating your groups, uh, posts and individuals, did you uh, actually identify which ones were going to be senior councillors and uh, neither did your secondary councillor Lever. Nowhere within the papers issued prior to the meeting on pages 25 and 26 of the meeting was it identified which posts that were to be filled would attract senior councillors' remuneration, and nowhere within the paper that was issued at the meeting by yourself, which is shown in Appendix 1 in today's uh, Item 3, did it identify which posts or individuals being nominated by the Labour Group would attract senior councillors' remuneration. However, in his speech, Councillor Hislop did, sorry, Hislop did nominate all five members of his group to senior councillor roles, and that was subsequently agreed without dissent. And this was seconded without amendment by Councillor Nicholl. Uh, Appendix 2 to Item 3 today states that uh, Councillor Driver assigned Peacock, McKee and McCutcheon had been appointed as senior councillors when in fact none of these individuals nor the positions they were granted were agreed by members at full council for a senior councillor role. Okay, I believe you've already had discussions with the governance officer on that, and he's given you an explanation for it. Um, uh, Alec, do you want to add anything to that? I, I did have correspondence with the, both councillors McClung and councillor Davidson from memory, sir. I explained my understanding of what happened at the council meeting. Uh, it's for members to agree or disagree exactly my understanding of what happened. As far as I was concerned, it was clear to me who the senior councillors were uh, from the note that you circulated, uh, and also the note that was circulated uh, by uh, Councillor Hislop. Okay, um, have we got 
Any amendments to that? I've moved the minutes and it's been seconded. Jim? Uh, in that case, I'll move an amendment. Uh, and the amendment will be that, that the minutes of item 5 of the pre previous meeting of the full council on the 25th of September 2014 be that the following members were appointed or confirmed as previously having been appointed senior councillors, namely councillors Nicholson, Hislop, Martin, Lever, Dempster, Syme, Ted Thompson, Ogilvy, McCaughtry, Dyke, Gilroy, Carson, Blake and Nicol, and therefore should be in receipt of the appropriate enhanced salary, and as a consequence of that being the accurate record of the decision made at full council on 25th of September 2014, the following councillors were not appointed as senior councillors, as inferred by Appendix 2 to Item 3 today, namely Councillor Dryborough, Peacock, McKee, Syme, McCutcheon, should not be in receipt of an enhanced salary, and if they have already done so following full council on the 25th of September, this enhanced salary should be repaid in full. Uh, if there's any dubiety about what was actually said at the meeting on the 25th, uh, there is a tape recording available. I've listened to it more than once. Okay, uh, we have a seconder. Okay, can we go to the vote? Leader, uh, Councillor McClung uh, in his usually inimitable fashion spoke very quickly there. I don't write that quickly. Has he got that written down, please? I have, yes. Yeah. Well, just, just a minute, is it, there's a lot to take in there in that short time, and uh, Mr Haswell's outlined that at the speed. Is it worthwhile the fairness to get further look at it? I mean, I can't take that level of information at that speed. It would be an ad hoc uh, decision I was taking, and I would like to listen back to, to the record and see if it is factual or not. The recording is for public consumption. The minutes are for us. Now, if you want to disagree with the minutes, you can disagree with the minutes in that basis. But... Uh, I think Alec can read out again what Councillor McClung said. Yeah. Right, we'll, adjourn, we'll adjourn this for a minute or two until Alex goes and gets a memo sent that he sent. Okay? And I've had a had a talk about it, and on advice, you know, I've been receiving about this. You know, I can't kind of see this amendment being competent. But I'll ask Alex then. Uh, Chairman, I, I've I've read the the amendment put forward by Councillor McClung. The 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 request to yourself and the council on the day was members were asked to consider the number of senior councillors uh, to be appointed and vacant positions for senior councillors. The slate which you gave me uh, had details of chairs and vice chairs. The protocol is that chairs and vice chairs in this council are normally senior councillors. Uh, what Councillor Hislop did, because he was putting forward a number of nominations, he identified the ones because the nominations he put forward made the number of senior councillors above the number that you're entitled to, which is 14. Councillor Hislop clearly marked that these were to be unsalaried positions, therefore they were not senior councillors. Whatever was said at the meeting, it was clear from the report what you were being asked to do, and what you did was exactly what you were being asked to do. Uh, on that basis, Chairman, it was your determination, but, but I'm not convinced what, what this is intended to achieve, because it, it does not reflect the decision taken by the Council at their meeting. John. Yeah, thanks for that. What it's intended to achieve is to actually accurate, accurate. Sorry, it was John first. Okay, sorry. Hi. Thank you, Leader. Um, it is actually on the amendment and the second paragraph following the name, which is incorrect, actually, and does not um, stipulate the way that was stipulated by Ivor on the day. So I'm sorry, but the amendment is incorrect. Okay, uh, Jim, then Ian. Yeah, thanks again, Leader, for letting me back in. Uh, I hear what uh, Councillor Dykes and uh, Mr Has were saying. However, Councillor Hislop, Hislop made a speech. He didn't tender any document. So how could it be marked which ones were going to be senior councillors and which ones weren't? What he actually said was 
in the interests of the residents of Dumfries and Galloway and the stability of this council. The Dumfries and Galloway Conservative and Unionist Council Group of Dumfries and Galloway Council wish to nominate the following councillors for senior councillor positions and committee vacancies as stipulated in your paper at item 5, pages 25, and he then goes on to name the five councillors. He does not at any point say which ones are to be senior councillors and which ones aren't. And there was no paper tendered at the meeting. And the paper that was tendered at the meeting by yourself, Leader, did not mark which ones were the ones that were to be appointed for senior councillor or not senior councillor role. Thanks very much, Jim. I heard you. Okay, uh, Alex. Uh, if I could reflect the accuracy of that comment, what Mr. Hislop may or may not have said, he handed me a piece of paper with the names on it. I have it in my files upstairs. If the member wishes to see it, I'm quite happy to show him it. I was given a piece of paper by an A4 sheet of paper with names typed on it, and it clearly stated salaried or unsalaried. I'm quite happy to get a copy of that and circulate it to all members, sir. I, I, I put forward my understanding and the understanding of the officers who were present at the meeting advising me exactly what the council's decision was. In my view, I have reflected that in the minutes, sir. Okay, Ian. First, then, Jane. Thank you, Leader. It's in relation to the amendment. Uh, the, the first part of the amendment shows that Councillor Gilroy, myself, and Councillor Nicholl uh, should be in receipt of the enhanced salary as a senior councillor. We are not, and that was never agreed. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Tom, then Ian. I just, I would seek government's advice here because nowhere in standing orders does it say that, uh, apart from the very first meeting of the council, that the council actually has to decide on who senior councillors should be. In the event there was no vote, apart from confirmation by the entire council, there was no division, the entire council agreed that certain members would take up positions. As has happened in the past, it was in the remit of those political parties who had the individuals for the political parties to decide who took, took up those senior positions. And I think it's well in line with previous practice, it's well in line with standing orders, that uh, the, the various political parties and the full council agreed to these going forward it's then up to the Tory group to decide who their senior councillors were. It's then up to the Labour group to decide who the, their senior councillors were. Now you can stand in orders that says the full council must decide on senior councillors apart from at the very first meeting of the council. Okay, Ian. Uh, Leader, I'm fairly sure that it's, it, it is fairly accurate at the minute, but at, that, at the same time, I've got my own record. I've still got it in file on what was agreed in the uh, disagreed on the day, but it was, all, it was pretty much agreement it was put forward. So I've got my own notes in regards to that. So I'll put forward a procedural motion that we do defer this until the next meeting of the full council and uh, so we can uh, analyse it with the fullest of information. Chair, I'd like to second uh, Councillor Crowley's motion. Okay, so we've got a, a motion and we've got an amendment. No, I'm not taking. I'm not taking Jim's. No. We've got a procedural motion, Leader, which yeah, takes precedence. Yeah. So the motion is that the minute is a correct record, and that's moved by the leader, seconded by deputy. My apologies, Leader. The motion, the motion is by the Leader, seconded by the Deputy Leader, and that is that the minute is a correct record of the business transacted at the meeting on the 25th of September. The amendment is by Councillor Carruthers, seconded by Councillor Bell, is that consideration of the minute be deferred for clarification of... So I can look back at my own record and make the, uh, an, a fully informed decision. Uh, and I can see myself exactly what's put forward and listen to the recording, so I'm making a fully informed decision rather than an ad hoc. I'm pretty sure in my own mind, but this has been sprung upon us. There's a lot of information to take in. I'd like to make sure that I'm making a fit an informed decision. If we can bottle that down. I'll leave that in your hands. I, I, I would question whether you would defer consideration of a minute to enable an individual member to go back and look at their own notes. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Listen, it's, it's I'm not, quite sure that in most minutes, individual members will say, I don't really recall that being I'm sorry, correct. But I, I find that very difficult to understand, to come out with comments like that. I, am, I have got my own notes, I've actually got them, my own paperwork still on file that was handed out on the day, and I can look back and refer to that. 
you saying you've got a copy of that, but I've actually got my own one, so I don't need to see your one. And I'm asked, I don't see why well, this affects the business. I think the, the, the cleanest way is to, to dispose of this today and come back to it. I think, uh, yeah, we'll get, we'll get the vote, but I think one of the things that uh, uh, Ian is that uh, we've long let that mean. So, you know, we long let that mean we made decisions on the information that was at that meeting uh, and the dialogue that took part then. So everybody should have been quite clear about what they're taking the decision on then. So the decision was made then. But anyway. Uh, Leader, I've sent a member of staff to go and get the note out of. The, the, the note that was given to by, me by Councillor Hislop and the note that was given to me by you. Uh, I'm going to go back. Is, is Councillor Crothers asking that you defer consideration of the entire minute or just paragraph five of the minute? Or what is he recommending you defer consideration of? Because can I remind you that the minute's here for approval, there's a council business to run. This is one part of a decision-making process that was taken on the 25th of September, which is now well advanced and you have reports forward to you today based on the decisions you take, took on the 25th of September. The question I would ask members is, if you defer it, are you just going to cancel this meeting today? Absolutely not, Lee. That's not my intention. So if, it, if, it, if it's condensed to the part that's in dispute, happy to, to make the motion on that. So it's only the part that's in dispute at this moment in time. Are you ready to proceed to the vote, Leader? Yep. Uh, Councillor Dykes. Sorry, Leader. Um, I was just going to ask, um, would it be appropriate for the Governance Officer to actually circulate the two pieces of paper before the end of this meeting so that we can actually get on with the business and um, also approve the minute or otherwise? Um, I, I just think... Okay, we'll do that. Thank you. That sounds a good idea. Thanks very much. Right, moving on to item four, which is update and corporate budget position report by Head of Finance. This report provides information in the overall budget model, both in capital and revenue terms. Sorry. You were getting ready to proceed to a motion and I you you got to the roll call there and it just for some reason it stopped. You've not made that no, no, we're, we're getting the information. I've decided to, to bring that back at the end. You'll have that information. You'll get that information first and then we'll take it at the end. Uh, this report provides information on overall budget model both in capital and revenue terms and highlights the revenue savings requirement of £32 million over the next three financial years. A lot of good work has been ongoing throughout the current financial year in relation to identifying operational efficiencies as a consequence of which the savings requirement which need to be found for the next financial year amount to £6.543 million rising to £17.8 million in the following year and £28.8 million in 2017-18. The report also sets out the availability of non-recurring policy development funding and the financial planning projections for capital. It has always been the view of the Labour Group that the budget should be set for a minimum of three years based on a clear financial strategy and it should include both revenue and capital financial planning. As a consequence, members will see that the report recommends that we adopt the strategic budget principles as set out in Appendix 4 and that all groups should ensure that their budget proposals follow those principles. In short, the report provides us with all the financial modelling and information we require to set our budget. Paul Garrett is uh, he's hiding behind there. Paul Garrett is with us and will ask him to answer any specific questions or highlight any issues for members. Open the members. Ian? Thanks, Chair. Um, uh, no questions on it. Uh, just to, to note uh, and uh, agree the recommendations um, by the SNP group uh, for this report and uh, happy for it to, to be agreed as such. Jane? 
Um, th thank you, Leader. Yes, I, I've got no problem with this report uh, at all. It's really just a question of um, information. Now, um, I'm well aware that on page 29, the CCS vacancy deletion um, has been through a committee, but um, you forgive me, I'm a little slow and it takes me a little bit of time to think these things through. But um, I had uh, looked at this and um, I would like to have confirmation about where these 4.5 staff of uh, currently vacant posts are coming out of because actually having looked at it I have discovered that I think there's going to be a disproportionate effect upon one area namely the stewardship area so I'm simply putting that down as a marker um, to ask the question about how that works I'm well aware it's been through I'm well aware of that but I'm simply saying that in terms of providing a service across the region equ equitably that needs to be considered Thanks. I think um, Alec will... Uh, yeah, Leader, I've uh, had a conversation with Councillor Maitland about this uh, <coughs> offline. Uh, I will provide her with details of where the vacancies are arising. Uh, there is also a, a, a CLD service review ongoing. Where one of the things that we'll look at will be equity of delivery across Dumfries and Galloway. So Councillor Maitland has my assurance that we're looking at that. Okay, Ian. Thank you, Leader. Just to say that uh, we, our group certainly thought we, we agree with the previous comments for the SNP group in regards to this, but Appendix 4 we felt was first class and we agree with it totally. Okay, Willie. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> uh, it's just on page 29, uh, Appendix 1 of the report, where it refers to kinship carers and uh, the, the, the Labour administration had the unenviable task in pulling this together, so they uh, should be applauded in presenting this and coming forward. I know it's Paul's report, but I have serious reservations, and I expressed these at the Social Work Service Committee on the 5th of December in terms of the financial savings within kinship care. Uh, and all it will take in, uh, is for two families uh, to face the difficulty in an ever-increasing uh, situation where kinship carers are on the increase, not only in terms of uh, residency orders, but also in terms of looked after children. And all it will take is for two families in a residency order uh, uh, that are prepared to take on a, 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 the role of kinship carers, not to because of the policy that's being pursued, and this will cost in the region of 150,000 for a child to go into care. Two children will then uh, wipe out that savings of 387,000 uh, pounds in that respect. So I have serious concerns about this policy, and I'm expressing them in, uh, as a marker just now. Okay, thanks for that, Willie. Um, okay, Ivor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's with regard to a question to Mr Garrett. Does he see any significant or material changes in the current budget figures from now until budget setting day? Because um, there are usually some tweaks, or will it just be the, the usual, maybe up 10,000 here and down 5,000 there, etc.? Don't, don't anticipate any material changes between now and budget setting. Uh, one of the issues was that we actually received an updated local government finance settlement uh, last week, but that basically confirmed the information we were anticipating, so uh, there's no real significant changes expected. One, one issue that did come through the settlement was they confirmed the funding for the Children and Young People's Bill and also for free school meals, and were liaising with the relevant services in terms of their investment requirements on those, but nothing that will affect the, the budget at this stage. Okay, can we go to the recommendations? Can we look 2.1, 2.2 and uh, agree the budget setting principles outlined in Appendix 4? Okay, the next item on the agenda is the release of draft budgets. Uh, this is not a budget debate, as members will not have had an opportunity to consider any draft budgets ahead of today's meeting. 
Trade Draft budgets released today will be subject to public consultation over the next two months, and councillors will have an opportunity to scrutinise and debate any proposals at service committees in January. We'll ask uh, if there are any draft budgets from other groups shortly, but members should by now have received a copy of the draft Labour group budget. In February, when we agreed the budget for 2014-15, I said that in future years, the old way of allocating funding and looking for cuts in a year-by-year -year department department basis cannot be cannot continue. That's why the Labour group draft budget formally re released today delivers on the decisions made in February, namely that we should provide a detailed revenue budget for the financial year 2015-16 but also firm indicative plans for the subsequent two financial years, 2016-17, 17-18. In addition, the draft budget is fully in line with the budget principles agreed earlier in the meeting at IM4, and it paves the way to deliver on a commitment made to set the Council's revenue and capital budgets at the same time. As I indicated in my comments at the start of the meeting, the Council recently agreed to prioritise investment in services that are most important to the people of Dumfries and Galloway. Building our region's economy to provide jobs for local people, protecting our most vulnerable people and giving our children and young people the very best start in life. That's why our draft budget includes proposals for the single biggest ever investment to end youth unemployment in our region. Our ambitious jobs plan, which is summarised in page 7 of the draft budget consultation paper and set out in detail within the policy development template document, aims to invest £3.5 million a year to deliver a youth guarantee for DG. That's a guaranteed place in education, training or a job for every young person in Dumfries and Galloway within four months of them leaving school or becoming unemployed. When I became leader just over a year ago, I said building the local economy would be our number one priority, and the draft budget released today shows this Labour administration acting on that commitment to the local economy and local businesses. As I've said, for the first time, the Council's capital budget will be agreed at the same time as the revenue budget, so the Labour group draft budget sets out our proposals for capital spending on pages 20 to 24 of the consultation document and in more detail within the capital funding allocations document. We reiterate the commitments to the priority projects of Dombiti Learning Campus, Dumfries Learning Town, Next Generation Broadband, the White Sands Flood Protection Scheme, the Kirkubri Charter and propose that we add in one new project and that's the Regional Archive Centre. Our draft capital budget Plans also confirm the indicative figures set for 2015-16, 17-18 for the various asset classes, with the exception of the allocations for school buildings and economic development. Instead, we propose an increase in funding for school buildings across the region from an indicative figure of £4.25 million to £5 million per year by 2017-18, with further provisional increases in future years. In relation to the economic development, the indicative figures set by members in March 2014 for 2017-18 was £1.5 million. However, the Labour Group proposes that the allocation is increased to £2 million. We recommend that £400,000 of this is set aside for the Srinrar Townscape Heritage Initiative, taking the full council allocation to £1 million for this project. This will maximise the potential to draw down external funding towards the £3.2 million plan to regenerate buildings within the Stranath Town Centre conservation area. In addition, we propose £100,000 is allocated to draw up plans for future regeneration projects in Stranath, including the possible development of new employment sites, small business units in the area. Members will also recall the £493,000 remains unallocated for regeneration projects in Srinagar due to savings in previous projects in the waterfront, and the allocation of this funding will be subject of consultation with Wigtonshire 
area committee. Our draft budget also proposes to allocate £500,000 from economic development funding during 2017-18 towards public realm improvements in Dumfries Town Centre and £500,000 is also allocated to support the Moat Bray project. A further £400,000 is confirmed for the planned Gretna public realm improvements taking the provision for the improvement projects in Gretna and Gretna Green and Springfield to £950,000. We also propose to allocate £100,000 towards developing future proposals for the M74 corridor and Chapel Cross. Turning now to the issue of savings, as members know, government cuts and continued council tax freeze mean that we need to make savings of £32 million over the next three years. This is on top of the £40 million of savings the Council has already made over the past four years. We cannot pretend that the scale of cuts being forced upon the Council can be achieved easily and without any pain. To do so would be dishonest. However, in determining our savings proposals, we have focused on protecting frontline services as best we can. The proposals for savings are set out in the draft Labour, Labour Group budget consultations on pages 8 to 19 and in more detail in the savings template document. It is proposed to make the most significant savings through the reorganisation of the Council, which, if agreed, will cut the number of departments from 6 to 4, saving over £2 million in management costs alone. As well as specific savings templates in the budget, service reviews in relation to support learning, roads and network management, fleet and vehicle maintenance and, enter and enterprising council training development have already been reported to the service committees and the recommendations agreed unanimously by all groups. Therefore, the £3.9 million of associated savings are reflected in the draft budget. In addition, it is proposed that a further 12 service reviews be held over the next three years with a provisional savings target of £7.9 million. Members will note that in the draft revenue budget on page 5 of the consultation document that efficiency savings of £2.1 million have already been identified for the year ahead, rising to £3.5 million by 2017-18. We have set a target for additional efficiency savings of 0.75% of the budget in 2016-17 and 1.5% by 2017-18. Should members wish to increase policy development funding in 2016-17 by £1 million and by £2 million by 2017-18, further savings to this level will need to be identified. Despite having to make £32 million worth of savings, the Labour Group draft budget proposes an increase in both the education and social work budgets for the year ahead. The consequence of that, of course, is that other departments will continue to bear the brunt of the savings. The proposals for the Labour Group are very much draft. Since becoming leader over a year ago, I have made clear that I am committed to leading an inclusive council. That means listening before decisions are made. Therefore, before the budget is agreed in February 2015, I want to hear the views of council staff, unions and local communities, putting them at the heart of the council's decision-making process. It's easy for a, to say a proposal is wrong, but that can't change it. We don't have the luxury of waving a magic wand and the government's cuts will disappear. The only thing we can do is try to find alternative savings for any of those we do not like. Therefore, my challenge to our trade unions local and local communities is to take part in the budget consultation process and bring any alternative to the table. On the subject of alternatives, can I ask if any of the groups have draft budgets they wish to release today? No? Okay, on that basis, can I ask members to note that the administration's draft budget has been published. It will now be a subject of public consultation, including public meetings, 
through the four local area committees. The public will also have the opportunity to put forward their views through the online survey that will be placed on the Council website over the next few days. Copies of the draft budget and survey will also be made available in local libraries and customer service centres, and members will have the opportunity to scrutinise and debate the proposals at each service committee in January. Thank you. No other proposals? Brian, you got a proposal? No, Leader. I think the saying goes, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, and certainly there's a good deal in this budget that I recognise. The SNP group is not presenting a budget today. We have lost confidence in the integrity of the process. Although we do not hold the administration solely responsible, confidential communications between our budget leads and officers were shared with other political groups in a clear and unacceptable departure from seven years established practice that all such discussions are confidential. That matter will be the subject of a formal complaint to the Chief Executive in the first instance, which will be formally lodged with him following this meeting. Notwithstanding our disillusionment with the process, we are determined to be constructive. Where we agree with your administration's proposals, we will support them. Where we have concerns, we will first scrutinise, then seek to amend. <coughs> we recognise there is significant concern over the service review of ASL provision. While we support the restructure and believe that it is the right way forward, we are not convinced that £2 million of savings from that one service can be justified. We note no provision has been made to continue additional funding to Dumfries and Galloway Citizens Advice Service. That omission equals to £180,000 funding cut to the organisation, which will result in redundancies. When only, when only days ago we were advised this region will be in the first phase of the rollout of universal credit, a process practically guaranteed to increase demand for advice services. These are only two issues arising out of initial examination of your proposals. There may very well be more. I note, Leader, that your proposal has policy funding currently unallocated, and I acknowledge your willingness to listen to other groups' views as the process continues. So we will present our own proposals in due course and look forward to the continuing debate both here and in the wider community, over the direction of your minority administration wishes to take this council. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Right. Um, other comments? We'll move on to item six, which is the shape of the council on proposals and future development delivery report by Chief Executive. This is the Chief Executive's report on the shape of the Council going forward. It sets out revised organisational arrangements for the Council based on a Ford Directorate model which the Council previously agreed to adopt and is based on three main principles. Reducing management and overhead costs, predict, protecting frontline services, removing duplication and inefficiency and structural commissioning and delivery di uh, division adopting the principle, do it once and do it well, organising services to meet the needs of service users and encouraging an open council approach, putting customers first and enabling us to support community development. This is a proposal which will see a fit for purpose, sustainable organisation for the next five years, as well as delivering projected savings of £2 million over three years in management costs alone, which is absolutely necessary at this time of funding reduction. I am now going to hand you over to the Chief Executive to introduce the report and to answer members' questions. Gavin, if you could give us an overview, please. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, I think the head of the finance paper shows the immense challenge that uh, we face in sustaining our services, um, particularly over the, the short and medium term. My report presents detailed proposals, as Leader has said, for restructuring the Council, which I believe will help meet these challenges. But even in the Administration's budget, uh, uh, there are still further efficiencies that we'll need to find. 
The first thing I would like to do is thank all of the staff and the numbered well over 200 who have contributed to the intensive piece of work uh, before members today. Um, they brought challenge, perspective and a let's do it attitude into uh, the final proposals. Um, I would point members to uh, paragraph 3.15 where key messages from frontline staff and, uh, all, and staff at all levels are summarised and these will be used to inform the vital delivery phase um, of this programme. Um, I won't uh, repeat, but I think in summary what I'm proposing is uh, moving from the six, direct, six to four directorates uh, with enhanced clarity of accountability, uh, securing efficiencies initially by reducing the management tiers and uh, equalising spans of control within the organisation, which the leader has mentioned, I believe, can release £2 million. And I've identified a series of uh, reviews which were identified through the staff consultation processes and then validated by the staff consultation, uh, which we believe will deliver further efficiencies. And finally, just to point out that this will be delivered through governance structures that I set out in 3.69, but also using existing HR policies so that we can enable the delivery of the significant change. And I met before this meeting um, um, with the trade unions just to confirm that we will, uh, they're, they're content to use existing HR policies. There may be, need to be a couple of tweaks in the matching uh, process as we get towards frontline later on in the process but certainly know that they were content that we have the sufficient policies to enable us to move forward. And for absolute clarity, this will be a three-year process. We must get each stage right, particularly in the initial restructuring and then service reviews, to ensure that we do create sustainability whilst delivering the necessary savings, to make sure we're actually protecting our vital priority services as we move through this. Because I think in the past, some of the restructuring, what this council has undertaken in the last 20 years, has not had sufficient forethought up front and the connectivity um, and implementation of it. So therefore, we, we, in the current environment of ever decreasing budgets, we need to make sure we get it right at each stage. And that's why there's, there's uh, I, I put a governance structure, which I think will help us ensure that we can achieve that over the period. I'm happy to take questions later. Members, Brian. Thanks very much, Leader. I very much welcome this report from the Chief Executive. It's very comprehensive. We have no difficulties uh, with the proposals for the shape of the Council, um, other than the time frame. Uh, that seems to me to be running over this term of office for elected members, and therefore a loss. there's a risk of loss of continuity. There is two years come May 15 for this council to run, and I would ask the Chief Executive to clarify, although he has touched on it, the need for a three-year programme, that that be reduced to two years, given a rollout, and six months for this council to scrutinise the progress that's been made and that the actual agreed outcomes have been achieved. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Collins. I think the, um, what I would say is that, that uh, we are going to sit down and work out the detailed programme, and I would bring that back to members. Uh, the reason I'm saying three years is that um, the work that we're undertaking in children's service and adult health and social care uh, will actually run over the next 18 months. Uh, I don't believe it would be appropriate to try and put a further layer of uh, what I would consider to be moving deck chairs at that point. But the substantive element of the savings will be delivered in the first two years. But I'm happy to look at that and bring it back with greater clarity on the programme for elected members for that scrutiny. But the three years was to take account of the fact that I would want the children's service inspection to be fully implemented. I would want to take a, a cognizance of the real impact of uh, health and social care in which the new body has not yet been set up and then move to perhaps the children's services um, structure at the very end of the process, but that does not mean I would take the, wouldn't take the advantage to do the service reviews and implement a management structure in advance of that. But I think if, if members are willing, I'll bring a more detailed um, identification of the programme and timing um, uh, following the Christmas break. 
Okay, Ivor. Chair, it's following similar lines, I think. One of the concerns a lot of the staff have is the length of time this can take and periods of not knowing where they are. I would welcome that we do stick to a maximum of three years, make sure that the staff have a sort of view that we will be there by three years. It's not something that's got to be oh, two and a half years. Oh, we've got another two and a half years to go because something didn't work in year one. And uh, if we can have that reassurance, because I think it gives them the confidence that we are moving in the direction. Absolutely, um, Councillor Hislop's absolutely right that in the discussion with the trade unions that I've had, they actually want when we decide the area that we are reviewing to do it quickly. And I think that's absolutely right. I think if we get the programme out, but I need to give reassurance to the vast majority of the staff working in the front line, this won't make much difference. And when it does, they will be involved in the service review. The management layers and the two million we will move um, reasonably quickly on because I think our experience in the organisation of customer and community service was it went on far too long. So that's why we, you know, I need to have discussions with the, uh, the, the trade unions about both the programme, the tools that we have available, because I think there may be a need when doing service reviews to shorten the programme slightly, to, to, to get it a bit quicker into the process. They're very happy to engage in those discussions. So we've already started that process, but you're absolutely right. When we identify, and, and when governance structures, there's a role for the members in there, the programme, the work, there's absolute clarity to everybody, that the speed, timescale and outcomes at that point. But you're absolutely right, take that on board, that we, we need to do it, and when we've decided to start the programme, we need to do it as quickly as possible. But that doesn't mean rushing it, because you know these are complex reviews, and at the end of it are vital services. So I'm, I'm conscious of that, so obviously we'll bring that assurance back through the next few months to members. Okay, Jane. Um, th thank you. Y yes, <clears throat> I mean, I, th I think this is an extremely ambitious and um, in many ways optimistic um, paper. Um, I, I don't disagree with many of its proposals. In fact, um, I, I think it's, it's absolutely going the right way. But um, I, I suppose I'm being cautious about the actual realism um, and the ability to deliver this. Um, the, the, the chief executive He's not pulling his punches. Um, he's made it quite clear, dotted through this report, are issues about a reduction of activity, um, uh, that we cannot make these savings unless people do go. Um, there's talk about the switching, the switch program. Um, I, think, I think members would like to have further information about uh, what is going on there. I do understand it's coming back in February, um, but uh, my clear understanding is that the council um, must not pull the wool over the public's eyes. The public will not wash a system, will not accept a system which has people still in employment of the council but not with a job. The post is deleted. That's just absolutely unacceptable. And uh, I, I think we need to be absolutely upfront about uh, how we're going to manage this. So I look forward to the, uh, the report in February. Um, as I say, I think, I think this is ambitious. I think it's uh, really interesting. Um, I would like some more information um, whether there are other examples of the centers of excellence which are discussed in the report. Um, I'd be happy to hear about that. Um, I wonder also um, whether the chief executive um, would uh, care to comment on whether or not, because we are a distant from the centre type um, um, council, whether or not we actually could realistically look at delivering our services in a different matter, in a different manner. Um, we're not going down that that um, that that route here uh, with the four um, uh, directorates. We decided not to do that, but you know, I I, I am I, I do see through this report a suggestion that that is one way of delivering different, differently and probably affecting services, uh, service um, savings. Thank you. You want to make a comment, Governor? Just... Well, I think, I think just to say it is, it, it is ambitious because the consequence of not being ambitious is that we have to make cuts to, to lifeline services. 
Um, I think it, that, thank you for, for pointing out it's a very complex process, particularly across the geography. If we were a city council, it's much easier to, to work out because you know everything's been the travelling distance. So therefore, where we locate, trying. I think at the heart of it is just to say it's about embedding management. And one of the things I said to uh, in our communities, and one of the things I was, I was very keen in the staff consultation to say, we mustn't confuse the structure of accountability with where the real management needs to be. And even though I'm talking about removing management, I'm also talking about further investment and direct supervision at the front line in our communities. And members will be aware that that's been, I think, where some of our gaps have been in service delivery. So through the programme, I'd be wanting to do that. Yes, I, I won't be drawn into the different models, but I will say we have to have a different model under the health and social care. Members have already agreed. Empowering our communities is the only way we're going to deal with growth. So I need to develop different models of delivery just to deal with the growth agenda. And that's based upon community delivery. So unless we're organised to work at a community level, how can we build that capacity in the community? So that's why it's challenging. But I think that, that, that absolutely, if we were not undertaking this, the first thing we get in the public consultation is, why are you not doing it? By, by setting this as the clear agenda, it gives a framework in which the, the future service reviews can fit with a clear governance structure to make sure we're looking across the entire council every time we're undertaking one of these reviews. Okay, Jean, you want back in? Just, just I wonder about the centres of excellence question. Um. Yes, there are, there are models of that available, number from England about where we want to take. And I think it's, for me, it's key about centre of excellence is about making each each directorate corporately responsible to its other colleagues, bringing together that, that, that we don't need to create centres of excellence in each directorate, but also create a, a, a cohesiveness, I don't think, that's existed between uh, um, the old services that worked in silos. So the centre of excellence, we have models, and be happy to talk to you uh, at your next group meeting or come and speak to you uh, individually. Okay, Alistair. Thanks very much indeed, Leader. A couple of points, sir, if I may, uh, followed by a question. Uh, first of all, uh, I think it's right and proper, and I would commend the Chief Executive that he's not, uh, to use Councillor Maitland's terminology, pulling his punches. I think in an issue of such magnitude and importance, Leader, if ever there was a time that members you know, need to be told what they need to know rather than what we want to hear, this is it. That's the first point I would make, Leader. And the second point is I would like to reinforce the comments by Councillor Collins and, and, and Islop. It's a cliché, I know, but it's true nonetheless. The most valuable resource this authority has is its workforce, its employees. And I think it's absolutely imperative that we don't have the uncertainty as to their future hanging over their heads like the sword of Damocles any day, than is absolutely, any day further than is absolutely necessary. I'm not suggesting, Leader, that you know, we, 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 we do in haste and then repent at leisure, but I think we've really got to push this on as quickly as we can. And finally, sir, the question... Paragraph 2.5 and 2.8, uh, it would be helpful for pedants such as myself to know what, uh, for, from the sake of clarity, Leader, what we're talking about here essentially is a remit with powers to the Chief Executive. In other words, not a remit and to report. That would be helpful to get clarification, Leader. Thank you. Go on. Recommendations 2.5, 2.8. Yeah. 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 What, what you're uh, agreeing is that I, I can start the process to implement um, and the appointment of the directors and start the process of redesign that would then fit into the governance structure that's set out. So establish a programme board, um, obviously be for members to consider how they would wish the member involvement within the governance arrangements and the committee structures, and, and I'd leave that to members. And then, um, so effectively, start putting in the governance framework. But, I, and, but I, I, what specifically at this point, I'm asking that I can start the process at director level so that I can move on that now um, to, um, to, to start using the, the design and the process and job descriptions to come back to members. And then the rest is really agreeing the governance framework that we'd wish to then move forward to develop the programme and bring that back, as I said, before we then move in the first stage. Obviously, the first thing I'd want to bring back are job descriptions for the new post of director within the new directorates for member consideration. At that time, obviously, I would be able to bring back the other papers that would support the programme. Oh, is that? 
Thank, thanks very much indeed, Leader. As far as I'm concerned, sir, from a personal perspective, I have no problems with what uh, Mr. Stevenson is suggesting in the response. Thank you. John. Thank you, Leader. I won't go over old ground. Um, I think it's been of particular interest what's been said already about the report. Um, we are in challenging times and, we, and, and it is a challenge when we have to redesign services. Um, I would make one specific comment though, and it's really to do with the Business Transformation Board. Um, I notice uh, on page 77 that you say that um, you propose that the corporate management team fulfills that board. I would only make one comment on that, and that would be to make a suggestion that the leader of the council is also included on that board. And I just wondered what the chief exec's um, position would be on that. I think it perhaps would, uh, would be for members to consider in working how they would wish the transformation steering group which would include elected members, whether or not that's the right place to be in scrutiny. I, I, I would suspect that if the chief, if the leader sat in the group, it might constrain some of the free and frank discussion that would be needed between the senior management team on moving it forward. Um, but, I mean, it, so, so I think the right place, perhaps, for political leadership is in the business uh, transformation steering group with the trade unions, so that actually members, that, that gives the scrutiny and the guarantee that members' wishes are actually getting taken through. And then that group would hold the CMT to account directly for the programme of work. Uh, it's just that, that, that the, 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 I think the, what I would see that the transformation board would, would be a challenging um, process uh, to undertake. But certainly it really depends how members would wish to take forward the transformation steering group. Okay, Jim. Yeah, thanks, Leader. I, I, I know all the hard work that's already been undertaken. However, in paragraphs 3.6, 0.7, 0.8, 0.9, and 0.15, there is absolutely no mention of union involvement. Can that be explained to me, please? Yes, ab absolutely. They're there. Um, we met the trade unions be before the report. Um, we were using the staff and the frontline staff as part of the process to develop the report. From this point on, the trade unions um, will have a seat at the table of how we would implement it forward. I had no proposals to take to them. The union's job is to protect terms and conditions. Um, and I was not about to engage with the trade unions in development of my proposals, who were then going to be involved in the scrutiny and the implementation of it afterwards. Um, so, so absolutely, the staff have been involved in developing my proposal. From this point on, the trade union's role will quite rightly be as an in-service re uh, review process in the consideration of moving it forward. Um, but trade union members sat in the various levels. Yeah. Thanks, Leader. Just a few questions. Some of them have been partly touched on. <coughs> Paragraph 3.13. Touches on statutory and non-statutory duties in regards to our priorities and commitments. Just if I would ask, we've got four questions for the Chief Executive. If we could just broaden on that within, within that paragraph, because statutory, non-statutory duties com competing against our priorities and commitments, I would imagine statutory duties would have, would, would have been, I've got four questions, so uh, we would have uh, surpassed that. So just to, to broaden that, I'd see what you mean in that. In regards to page 49, there's a table at the bottom of page 49. You could just explain what that means. It looks like the, it's a gearing of managers looking after managers. If you could just, at the bottom of page 49, I'll bring this a bit closer, at the bottom of page 49, there's a table, and it's, uh, it looks, it's, I'm not exactly sure what it means, but it looks as if it's, it's explaining the manager to manager ratio, how they look after it in the line. So just when we come to that, uh, enterprise and councils within, it's, it's within the, the fact that it's an enterprise and council, it's been to E and I, we looked at that, but there certainly was some concerns put at that point at that committee, and it's not exactly sure what, uh, within the papers, what the framework governance structure will look like. They certainly, the scrutiny and performance uh, committee are uh, looking at a, a degree of work in regards to procurement, and I think it, it lies certainly under the same type of remit. So I'd like just to explain or how it will come forward in regards to the governance of framework, what that will look like. Will it actually be a committee of the council in regards to an enterprising council? and the advisory board, which you've actually touched on, the transformation steering group, whatever it may be called, the membership. That was my last question in regards to that. What, what do you think that will look like in, in regards to both uh, staff and political membership? Uh, thank you. The, 
I think the statutory and non-statutory duties is a bit of a red herring. And it keeps coming up, and it's come up through previous budget meetings. We have a number of statutory duties in which it's totally up to us to determine how. I mean, we've got a statutory duty to deliver education, but it doesn't really tell you how. But we have things that are not statutory duties that actually are in custom and practice what we expect the council to do. So we have a statutory duty of waste, but it's not necessarily about picking bins up. So I think there's, 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 and I think that what we were saying is that a lot of the things that actually are a counsel to the public are not statutory. So therefore, what we were saying is that, that actually, if we're using the process of our priorities and commitments of this council, below that there are things that in the coming paper we talk about objectives. That's where you're trying to cover objectives are sort of the statutory duties. We have to do them, but there's 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 room for the the, the notice, uh, notion of it. And, and actually, we can fulfil a statutory duty by doing nothing. So, so what they were saying was, if we could strip that out and get you focused on what is it in outcome terms that we require to deliver in priority terms, that helps frontline staff understand where they fit into the jobs. Otherwise, you know, I, I could actually have the entire council budget delivering education. That would fulfil a statutory duty, but it wouldn't actually... Uh, fulfill the elements of where we got in. So I think that one in me was just everybody in that wider grouping of 200 staff trying to explain to them that it's not simple just to say if we just did statutory duties and stopped all the non-statutory, the council would work, because that's not how the framework was ever designed. I think the second one in 3.57, this is really part of the, the summary of the evidence in which I believe we can actually make significant savings of the £2 million reasonably quickly for members. What that's telling you is on the left-hand side, it's the, it's the number of relationships that we have at one-to-one. -one. So we have a manager who has a span of control of one member of staff. And moving to the others, we have a number of one-to-seven, and I think actually we have examples of one-to-80. Look at to Matthew. Yeah, one-to-80s in the council. That's wrong. The reason that comes isn't that's where we started. But as you add new services on and, and we've got new responsibilities, this is the consequence of it within a large public body, that we end up, well, we need someone at that grade to do a professional service. So, they might own, so that's why you end up with these one-to-ones all over the place. As we restructure, as new services come on board, as new duties come on board, you end up with this as a consequence. So what, this is opportunity for us to rationalise that. And that's why I was saying earlier, there's real opportunity to release money to put more supervisory in to deal with some of these 1 to 20, 1 to 30, which are unmanageable levels of, of supervision and management, by releasing from what I consider to be the professional end, where people, effect, you know, are getting management salaries for managing one people, one person. So therefore, there's far more scope within their job to manage wider and numbers of staff. By doing that, it will release managers at that level. Because if, if we've got five managers doing one to one, then you could have two managers with broader spans of control. That's simplicity. There's more detail below it, but that's what that's telling you. That that's why I'm, I'm confident that we could move on those two million uh, reasonably quickly within that process if I get the top sorted out. So it's 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 and it's, it's not it's not anybody's fault. It's a consequence. If you look at any organisation, large organisation, you'll see that three or four years after any sort of restructuring, it creeps back in. The reason I want to put the governance rigor is that make sure at the end of the three years we're not starting this again. We don't end up with building in lower spans of control again, because that's actually, if you look at some of the organisations see Glasgow did, Glasgow have got this again. So and Stirling's a really good example, that five years ago Stirling took 115 managers out by just telling them they were out. There was no consultation, they left. Actually, 70 of them are back in in a one-to-one -one relationship, because they needed them to manage things. So that's what I need to avoid in the programme. The Enterprising Council, I mean, I recognise that that was a debate at uh, p and &E. I think there's two things we need to confuse. There is the, you know, this is not about us going out there and stealing business. It's, it's where do we put our centre of excellence for how we should be enterprising in everything we do, in the delivery of adult care, in the, in the development of communities, in the contracting or commissioning at local level for what we do. We have an excellent model, and, and I did discuss this with you, Councillor Grosvenor, well share, of where in building maintenance, we have a fabulous model that supports local employment by having term contracts with lots of small suppliers. 
it means we take some of the risk for CDM and health and safety and project management of the small companies. But when we need work done, we fire it straight out to them. There's electronic billing, huge cost saving. If that, on, if that enterprising approach was taken to other aspects of the council delivery, say in social work or in education, as a framework, that would allow us to be able to have very quick contracts for services we need that are not about us employing staff to do it. So at the heart, at the heart of my development of that, that we'd bring back to members um, before we'd implement, is around, it's bringing that skill set, that enterprising entrepreneurial skill set into one place but using it to apply it across the council, as well as the traditional services, I know that, that, that we need to get absolutely right. But that's more about that. It's how do you take that expertise and working with a sharper end out there? And actually, I think it would be promoting and increasing a private sector involvement and social enterprise involvement by getting that right. Because we can't build a social enterprise network if we all we're doing, if we look at home care, is transferring huge overheads to them on training, um, accountancy, law, that none of our small businesses or enterprises really set up to do. So that's, that's what that's about for me when I'm, I refer to it. Now, I know there are issues about our trading, so I think I deal with both of those as I brought a paper back to members. And the final bit is the advisory board. I think it needs to be small. Um, the last thing we'd want is an enormous committee falling over itself. I think it would be for members to, to decide how they'd want to do it, but I think it would be a small group of members a uh, couple of representatives in the joint trade unions, able to get in about the detail, but also to maintain that number through the period so you build up an expertise in it to work our way through. Because it's actually about holding to account. It's not decision-making, but it's about having that interaction and that steer and that scrutiny that we hold through the process. And the larger you make the group, the less you can have that one-to-one -one discussion moving forward. So I, I would consider it to be a small group with a couple of trade union uh, trade unions building up an expertise over the programme, of, of, of which would be a very complex programme. But I think it would be for members to decide how that would fit in and, and perhaps take the opportunity to work how you'd want to do that, along with perhaps any divisions to committee structures that you <coughs> want to bring forward. Ian, you went back in. I'll well, just be very brief. No, thanks very much. It was a detailed explanation. Like I say, we've touched already in regards to the Enterprise and Council side and the Council Act as a main contractor. Not against that at all, very much for it. If it, if it helps uh, small to medium sized enterprises, it's the governance and the framework, the structure of it, and the, the members' involvement. I think there absolutely should be some, some sort of member involvement in there through the committee structure. Uh, no, and, and your answer in regards to the, the page 49, I agree with you entirely in regards to it's, it's, if, if we've got to take this top heavy structure out of the way, set it to the side, and put in a kind of more lean structure there, that it doesn't just come back in in a few years' time and start to re re uh, replicate that's already there, which is really a bit of a mistake as it stands. So, no, thanks very much, Leader. Hey, Tom. Uh, th thanks, uh, <coughs> Leader. i just come back to 2.7, uh, the recommendation there. What, what I was going to suggest is that uh, in terms of paragraph 336, which is in page 45, and it's talking about the proposed reshape of the Council, the appropriate for elected members to review the current service committee structure and delegations. I'd like to suggest that is dealt with by the uh, Ad Hoc Review Schemes Committee. It's already got a fair bit of expertise in looking at committee structures and delegations, and it should just continue to carry out that role. Bear in mind what the Chief Executive said, when you come to the Business Transformation Steering Group, I set out at 369 on page 52, uh, and that, that's there to challenge and scrutinise the development and delivery of uh, what the Chief Executive is attempting to do. I don't think that would be appropriate to go to the committee I've just mentioned, but that committee could maybe take a look at how we set up this uh, transformation board. Now, the committee is meeting at the end of January. That way, we'll be able to get a report back here for February. And I think if that was agreed, it would be for every political group to feed in to the uh, ad hoc subcommittee to take a look at the membership of this transformation group. Um, obviously, depending on how many trade union reps were there, that might determine how many elected uh, <coughs> member reps would there. So I'd make that suggestion for uh, the recommendation at 2.7, uh, leader. Okay, yeah, I think that's quite a good idea. Andy? Uh, thanks for letting me in, leader. Uh, like uh, others, I'm, I'm generally very supportive and commend the report. However, I've got one wee concern 
Um, one of the secrets of history, of course, is we learn from it. Um, and older members and some staff here, here today will remember the dark days of the 2000s when SWIA tore the social work department to pieces um, and the subsequent action plans. And that, very briefly, was when we had one big corporate um, education uh, social work department. Um, and it was the lack of identity of, of, of the, the role of social work as opposed to where they were actually were. So whilst I agree with the way Gavin's structure in this, um, I think we need to get some assurances that um, uh, the lessons learned from the 2000s won't uh, crop up again um, and the social work function will be seen as a social work function irrespective of who actually manages it. I think that's actually uh, crucial for the staff and for the public. Thank you for that, Andy. I think that absolutely, I think there's, there's, there's two things I would say. that There's a paper going to come to the next Health and Social Care Integration Board around professional leadership of adult health and, and social care. And therefore, that actually teases out a number of issues and how we're going to resolve some of the professional issues relating to professional leadership. I think the wider issue for me, uh, as you referred to, is not to, to repeat, but we've actually now been operating a, uh, an integrated children's service management team executive it meets every Tuesday morning under um, uh, Colin Grant's leadership, which looks at this agenda. That has been subject to quite detailed review by the care inspectorate, and they will be reporting in January. And I know uh, from initial feedback, they're very impressed, actually, we've moved further forward than anywhere else in, in, in Scotland, and actually having the health service, the police, social work, and education as one management team, and that's how it's operating. So I think by getting that greater understanding, it takes away some of the risk of just bolting two together and losing someone's identity. And actually, the, the, the operation of that is giving me confidence that actually social work exercising its absolute professional responsibility does have, a, a, does have the huge say in the, in, in the right part, which is the risk assessment at the front end. But, you know, I'm very mindful of the past that, you know, this isn't about bolting things together because they will fall apart. This is about building a management team that understands that you're not a head of service for something. You're the head of service for that new directorate. You're responsible for all of the directorate, not just the bit that may sit under you. So very conscious of that, taking it forward. And I, I do recognise that, that as health and social care model develops, I'll need to come back to, tell, to give members reassurance of how that fits into our governance structure at future dates. So I'll keep that very much my eye on that. Dennis. Thanks, Leader. And like everybody else, I obviously welcome this report. And I think what we're seeing today is the, is the, the depth of concern and commitment that the the council members have. I think every one of the 47 members in this chamber will want to see regular reports on what's going on at council. So I'm a little concerned under 2.8 that we're only going to get six monthly maybe reports. I believe it should at least be quarterly. And I would even have liked to see a standing thing on our full council paper for this. And if there's nothing to report, fine. But every quarter we at least get something on it because six monthly or, or more, I think, on this issue is too long. I mean, we're talking three years. That, 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 um, <coughs> Six, six reports maximum, and I think that's not enough. I think every member here really w will want to know exactly what's going on, or as much as it can be told, and I think it's got to at least be quarterly. Ian. Uh, thanks, Chair. I'm very supportive of this, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I think it's a testament to the staff who've worked on this and to the uh, determination of, uh, I think, all three administrations under this term of the Council to get where we are today. I would just want to ask uh, one thing, that the, the projected sort of savings and in income uh, um, extend to about two million in year three. Um, the template seems to be predicated largely on management efficiencies. I take it the corporate asset management strategy will be a feature of it, uh, and that, that will be uh, reflected in the potential savings um, uh, over the three-year period. Absolutely, we have some really tough decisions to take on there, and again, that may be one where I may, might need to come back to, to members with different models, not talking about sourcing, but the different models um, of operation within the Council or different partnership models with other public partners to try and drive that agenda forward. But absolutely, we have the challenge of, of increasing energy bills, 
climate change, revenue costs. Uh, they're huge burdens in the, on our revenue budget. So therefore, that's absolutely, you can regard that. And that's why I'm bringing together all of those property people into the one place, energy, because uh, uh, to bring that together. So absolutely, that will be part of the ongoing efficiency program. Stephen. Thank you, Leader. Um, just looking at 3.41 on page 46, uh, under the organising our services to meet the needs of service users, etc. Um, you draw attention there to an, an area of culture uh, within um, managers and how they seem to not have the understanding on how they could uh, focus their service towards their communities. And I was just wanting to ask what steps um, you'd be able to take or could you give examples of areas of good practice um, that would actually address this? I think the fundamental issue here is that, that, that our services and, and, and a lot of the public don't understand, we provide, I think that I've got over 2,100 statutory duties and responsibilities. Our services are, are broad ranging and very professionally driven. So, so um, there's a real issue about sometimes we set our services up to meet the statutory requirement. And so therefore we're all focused on the professionalization of it. And sometimes we miss what does it mean for our communities? How do we engage with our communities? What they would actually want? So, some, so, so a lot of services were originally designed to deal with either ring-fenced funding that came down or these are, these are the musts that you must do. So you design your service in relation to the top down. What, what was challenging through the group was challenging them to change the attitude to say, what is it your community's value, need and want? What's important to them? And how would you do that? How could you satisfy that? wish from the top with the way the communities would like it delivered and actually that would open their mind to different ways to deliver it and and i think that if, because if, you, if you're driving it from the top down you, you sometimes lose the the basic efficiency where i would say that how do we change that culture we have really good evidence now being tested through the children's services work on how you start that culture one the biggest challenge we've got is changing the culture across all the partners in relation to our work particularly in child protection so we've got really good evidence now of how we do that. And it's about communication, it's about leadership, it's about newsletters, it's about quality assurance feeding back in, it's about engagement with service users. So we've actually got the model that's now tested there and we'll get validation back from the inspectors that actually can fit to anything we're going to look at of where we go. But the biggest bit is actually talking to your customer and listening to your customer and then having the ability to then engage back to can I satisfy my statutory duty, my national outcome, with what they would want? And they're not, they're not always possible, but in the vast majority of cases. And what we got was people saying there, how do, you know, if I'm told by the government I must deliver X hours of, well, how do I do that and engage with the communities who might want more or less? And I just, we can help them through that because it's a journey we're on with children's services. But I'll be happy to sit down and, uh, after Christmas with you and point you to some of the, uh, the models that we're working up. You could have them, have them all after Christmas dinner. <laughs> uh, Jane? Um, when the next report comes back, or in some shape or form, um, could we possibly have an absolute explicit um, set out about how we deal with issues such as complaints um, with a small team um, at the top. Um, we need to be absolutely sure that the governance functions and structures are completely separate and you show us how that's going to work. I, I, would like to, I would like to have that laid out explicitly as to how that's going to work. Who's going to assume which responsibility statutorily? Uh, uh, thank you for that. The um, um, Assistant Chief Executive is currently reviewing um, both the, the structure and capacity of a complaints team. So happy to, to align that to, because obviously one of the big risks, that's a real measure of the temperature as we move through the process. So we're happy to incorporate that in. But just to say that I have recognised that, um, that, that we have capacity issues um, in, in there and the Assistant Chief Executive is looking at that now and bringing a report back to CMT following Christmas. So we'll feed that back into a forthcoming report. I think it's important that's why I think the role of the steering group 
to actually make sure the temperature is being tested from your perspective as elected members is important as well. So we'll feed that in. Okay, we'll go to the recommendations. Um, can we note 2.1, approve 2.2, note 2.3, 2.4, 3.2.5, uh, with the assurances that the Garvin gave, and agree 2.6, which is the governance report and mechanisms, and 2.7, there was a suggestion that we have remit this to the ad hoc subcommittee scheme of delegation. Sorry. John? Uh, leader, under 2.6, um, I did bring up a suggestion. Um, I understand where the Chief Executive is coming from. So, therefore, I would just ask that we get a minute from that meeting. I think that would be helpful. Fine. Yep. Agreed. Um, 2.7, as I said, is there anybody any objection to remitting this to the ad hoc subcommittee for scheme of delegation? I propose. No? Good. Paid. And 2.8, um, I think it was a suggestion about quarterly reports. Okay, we can have that in. Okay. Okay, if we can um, move on to item 7, which is embedding our priorities and commitments in our business plan arrangements. Following on from full council on the 25th of September, officers were asked to develop performance targets to measure the delivery of new priorities and commitments. This next paper gives members a progress report on that work, detailed mainly in appendices 1 and 2. It also highlights the work still in development, uh, including anti-poverty strategy, regional economic strategy, integrated children's plan, and adult health and social care strategic plan. We've also been asked to agree uh, what future involvement members want in this work, and to agree the business plan guidance which will embed this approach. Uh, Liz, is, is Liz Manson oh, right, right. uh, here to take any members' questions. Do you have members have any comments, questions? Jane? Um, ye yes, I, I'm, I'm not totally clear whether I'm being asked to agree some of these or whether I'm being asked to note um, that they'll come through the business um, cases. Can I be absolutely clear? Because I mean, I, I have a view about on page 88, um, the, uh, the reference number 232 on Appendix 1, which is about the percentage of pupils from deprived areas gaining five-plus awards at Level 5. And uh, I'm not absolutely clear whether I should be discussing that now or whether I should, um, you know, wait and there'll be an opportunity to input. It's because I don't sit on the Education Committee, so I'd be uh, interested to know what I'm supposed to be, be doing here. Thank you for that. Um, we have set out here about 60 indicators that we see are the right ones to um, measure the progress in terms of the commitments that you've set. Councillor Maitland is quite right that there will be an opportunity when the business plans come forward to you um, in the new year. There will be member development sessions which are open to all members to go along to, but it is the service committees who actually agree the business plans themselves. So obviously this is a part of a process, so we'd be very happy to hear from any members about issues to do with any of the individual indicators that we will feed into that process. But these are the indicators that we're working on which will come through as part of the business plans. Okay, 
Okay, can we go to recommendations? Can we agree 2.1, note 2.2, agree 2.3, and uh, approve the 2.4? Move on to item eight, which is review uh, uh, standing orders and schemes of delegation. This is uh, a re this report is one of a series containing recommendations from the ad hoc subcommittee established to review the council's standing orders and scheme of administration. It specifically addresses issues previously raised by members regarding the record of hearings of the employment appeals subcommittee reporting arrangements for the social work services and housing subcommittees and the remit of the audit and risk management committee. We've also been asked to make an appointment to the post of chairman to the welfare reform subcommittee. I'm sure that Alex will be happy to answer any questions before we proceed to the recommendations. Uh, perhaps, first of all, uh, we should make an, try and make uh, the appointment to the Chair of the Welfare Reform Subcommittee. Ronnie. Yeah, thanks, David. I, I quite happily propose that uh, Councillor Smith takes up that position. Okay. Thank you, Leader. I'm happy to second that proposal. Any other nominations? No. Thank you. That's one of them done. Okay, do members have any questions? Ada? Chair, it was a point I raised that the subcommittee, it's when you're recording that there has been a vote, um, it's recorded as there has been a vote and the outcome was one of the three grounds. Now, my concern that the subcommittee was the fact that you dismiss the appeal, or if you partially uphold it, the person who then takes it further could say, well, actually, it wasn't partially, it was the other members agreed and totally. And it was just how, how you actually recorded that part of it to make sure that um, you weren't actually giving false information out or things that could be construed differently so that somebody could move it forward in a different route. Thank you, Leader. Uh, I, I understand what Councillor Heslip is saying. I, I understand that the subcommittee debated that at, at, some, at some length. Uh, basically, the minute of the meeting will record the fact there was a vote by ballot and the, deci the, the decision was X. It will not say who voted, how they voted, or what the numbers in the vote were. It will merely say there was a vote by ballot. Following a vote by ballot, the appeal was upheld, dismissed, or partially upheld. If you go further than that, Councillor Hislop's quite right. That would be the point at which there may be further process involved based on what comes out, numbers, names, etc. And that's why uh, the council has historically always resisted recording names or dissents or anything like that. I do take the point. I don't think it'll lead to any further appeals or anything like that. That wouldn't be happening anyway. Okay, no other members. Can we agree 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, 2.4, 2.5, 2.6? We've already appointed the, the chairman at 2.7, and can we note 2.8? So which 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 is it? So you're on. Motion. 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 Motion
I'd say. It's nine. I'll give you the new place to start point. When we did the drop notes, but we went the running order. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. I was getting confused with the numbers here. Let's change to a wee bit. But anyway, um, we're on the item now, which is appointment to outside bodies. This is, um, we're being asked to appoint one more member of the Strategic Partnership. Can we have any nominations? Jim? I propose if um, he would be willing to accept that Councillor Collins takes it up. Yeah. Thanks, Just, it's on proportionality in regards to this. Uh, we were certainly thinking about putting somebody forward, but it's a proportionality question, but we really want to get to the bottom of how many people are on the Friesen Galloway uh, from, the, from the council and, and what's the proportionate basis as it stands. We've made this point before. We've asked it to come back to full council, looking at it so we can appoint on a proportionate basis. We've got six members. We're the fourth largest group on the council, but we've got no representation here. So that needs to be addressed at some point. SNP clearly have 10, they have a much larger uh, a company uh, as what we do certainly, but it needs to be addressed, uh, Leader. Uh, this is something which, which, which is currently being looked at uh, because of changes across the piece. Historically, the Council has endeavoured to achieve proportionality where possible on membership of outside bodies uh, because of changes <coughs> as Councillor Crothers has alluded to that's become somewhat skewed. Uh, can I say to you, Leader, that one of the issues that we'll be coming forward and we'll be looking at in the report you discussed earlier on the review of outside bodies, which we've already started, one of the issues that we'll be asking the subcommittee to look at carefully will be where they want proportionality on which body. So clearly that will come forward within the next three months, Leader. Uh, I hope that's sufficient for Councillor Crothers. I mean, it's three months, you see, we have to wait, we've heard this before, but we need to see it coming forward, and it's it's more about the content, how, what it'll look like, because I know what the political lo uh, looks like, the shape of it is, and it's quite clearly leaning towards one way, it needs to be addressed. Colin? Chair, I would certainly welcome a report on um, proportionality. Members will recall that after the 2012 council elections, the Labour group were the largest group on the council and had no membership at all within the strategic partnership because of political decisions taken um, by the previous administration. So I would certainly welcome a report on the uh, proportionality. Okay, we've got a nomination. No other nominations. Okay, welcome back. Thanks, Roddy. Apologies, can you, um, there's something happening at the moment, uh, I don't, uh, I don't, uh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what it is, but if we can, if we can give it a few minutes before we go into the next agenda, I appreciate it, thanks. Can wait ten minutes. Yep, ten minutes. Okay, thanks.
if, if we move on to item 10, which is a notice of motion, feel in poverty and report by the Assistant Chief Executive. We have, now have a motion from Councillor Scobie and Foster regarding the council stand and feel in poverty. The, the Labour Group has always taken a position that we support the removal of delegations for motions. Uh, however, I do have to say this motion does, um, you know, push the limits a bit, but this council has a system of delegated powers to committees. The Policy Resources Committee has already agreed a very clear timetable for the development of the region's first ever anti-poverty strategy, and clearly tackling fuel poverty is an important element of that, albeit only one element. Part of the process was our successful uh, conference in October, uh, which not every member attended, and you know, um, for, for whatever reason. The non-aligned group, however, did manage to table this motion two days before the conference, along which I'm sure was coincidental. Uh, there was press went out, a press release went out, which included a statement to the press offering to find them um, someone living in poverty and in a dump house for a photo opportunity, presumably, along with Councillor Scobie. I was pleased to see the press did not take up this offer. The issue of tackling poverty is a serious matter. It requires a proper cons pro comprehensive strategy covering all aspects of poverty, from child poverty, which is arguably the biggest issue facing the region, to fuel poverty and many other matters. The development of that strategy is underway. The first decision we therefore have to make is whether we remove delegated powers from Policy Resources Committee. Does any member wish to do so? Right. Yeah, Chair, I would uh, move the removal. Uh, and, and again, I would commend, uh, as I've done in the past year, you and the Labour Group uh, in bringing back the anti-poverty strategy. I think it was an eminent gentleman that once said this is not an event, uh, as indeed. Uh, this is just a um, uh, removed delegation. Do you have a second? Have it Chair. Have it a second, Chair. Jill? I propose that we don't remove delegation. I know it's an emotive subject, but as you've just said yourself, um, there are uh, ways and means, and it's been undertaken, and that this is pushing the boundaries. Okay. Okay. We've got a procedural, procedural motion before you uh, in relation to item 10 on the agenda. There's a motion by Councillor Scobie, seconded by Councillor Forster, that delegation be removed from the Policy and Resources Committee to enable this Council to consider the notice of motion before it on fuel poverty. The amendment is by Councillor Dyke, seconded by Councillor Prentice, and that is that a delegation be not removed since the matter is being addressed through the Policy and Resources Committee. Are you ready to proceed to the vote, Leader? Yep. Leader. Motion. Deputy Leader. Motion. Councillor Bell. Councillor Blake. Amendment. Councillor Brody. Councillor Ian Carruthers. Amendment. Councillor Carmen Carruthers. Amendment. Councillor Carson. Amendment. Councillor Collins. Motion. Councillor Davidson. Motion. Councillor Dempster. Motion. Councillor Dick. Motion. Councillor Diggle. Councillor Dryborough. Motion. Councillor Dykes. Amendment. Councillor Ferguson. Motion. Councillor Forster. Motion. Councillor Geddes. Councillor Grimm. Amendment. Councillor Yen. Motion. Councillor Hislop. Amendment. Councillor Lever. Motion. Councillor McCaughtry. Motion. Councillor McClung. Motion. Councillor McComb. Amendment. Councillor McCutcheon. Motion. Councillor McGregor. Amendment. Councillor McKee. Motion. Councillor Maitland. Amendment. Councillor Mayo. Councillor Marshall. Motion. Councillor Martin. Motion. Councillor Nicol. Councillor Ogilvy. Motion. Councillor Peacock. Amendment. Councillor Prentice. Amendment. Councillor Scobie. Motion. Councillor Smith. Councillor Stitt. Motion. 
Councillor Sam. Motion. Councillor Tate. Motion. Councillor Stephen Thompson. Motion. Councillor Tuckfield. Amendment. Councillor Wits. Motion. Councillor Wood. And Councillor Wiper is not present. The motion is carried by 27 votes to 17. Okay, well, well. Thank you, Chair, uh, and the members who voted this, uh, and I don't believe that it is stretching it in any uh, manner or means, uh, the motion that is before us today. Uh, it is a, a, a huge issue within Dumfries and Galloway, where indeed 40-plus uh, percent uh, of those living in uh, socially rented and indeed private houses suffer from uh, fuel poverty uh, and they have no escape and, and from fuel poverty uh, leads on to many other uh, illnesses uh, and uh, attacks the very well-being of the people within Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, as I say, uh, I said at the beginning uh, when I was moving, for the, the removal of uh, delegation, uh, Chair, I would commend you in, in bringing back the anti-poverty strategy, and indeed in 1995 96 uh, this was one of the first posts that was deleted from Dumfries and Galloway in a, an anti-poverty officer within Dumfries and Galloway. So again, you and the, the Labour uh, Group administration, I would commend them on this. I think I said in opening chair uh, on, on the removal of delega or to remove delegated that it was the eminent gentleman that once said that that uh, the issue was not an event but a process. An anti-poverty strategy is a process, and this is only one part of, of, of uh, poverty. Where indeed uh, in Scotland it's one in five children who suffer from poverty, and I believe it's even higher in parts of Dumfries and Galloway where it's recognised as one in three uh, in that respect, then we must be doing as much as we can in terms of, of poverty, uh, and this is one part in terms of fuel uh, poverty that we've got to be uh, addressing uh, as an issue. I make reference in uh, the, the, the motion uh, in terms of uh, how we deal with our uh, transport of, of, of our elderly, those that uh, qualify for, for a bus pass, and we make provision within that, and that is only an example. There are other issues in terms of the discretionary housing payment uh, to deal with, 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 the, with the odious bedroom tax uh, and many others. And now we have welfare reform as part of the, the, the Scottish Government's ability to look at this, and I think we should be lobbying the Scottish Government to introduce some means by which we are able to deal with fuel poverty. And uh, I caught the tail end of Craig's presentation uh, uh, at the beginning where we've be received awards, and we've got to build on that <coughs> to make sure that we address the fuel poverty that exists. There have been uh, suggestions put in terms of Housing associations uh, collectively uh, purchasing their own uh, energy and making it available to their tenants. That, that's uh, admirable and laudable. Uh, and indeed, there was another suggestion where on uh, planning gain, we may want to, as a community benefit, look at you know, the, the renewables and how we could direct that to uh, fuel poverty and for people to draw on that. I think we've got to be going to the Scottish Government and asking them to recognise this as a part of the anti-poverty strategy, uh, poverty in the main, but it's to specifically deal with the fuel poverty. So in that respect, Chair, I would hope that the, the, the Council would endorse uh, and agree the motion that we have before us, not stretching it, but recognising 
that we have 40 plus percent of people in our region who are living in fuel poverty to recognise that and to do something about it. I so move, Chair. Okay. Happy to second, Chair. Okay, uh, Ted. Um, although I very much appreciate the sentiments uh, behind this motion, um, as Willie has noted himself and as the council leader has said, um, this council already has begun on the first ever anti-poverty strategy. And on that basis, I believe that um, we should amend um, the motion by Councillor Scobie to read that this council notes that the work already commenced on the development of the first ever anti-poverty strategy for Dumfries and Galloway agrees that all members should play an active part in the development of that strategy in line with the clear timetable agreed by the Policy and Resources Committee. Colin. We're all quite happy to, um, to second that particular motion. I think, as you made quite clear at the beginning, we began the process of developing the first of our anti-poverty strategy for this region. That poverty strategy, anti-poverty strategy, needs to encapsulate not only the issue of fuel poverty, but the whole range of issues facing this region, not least, of course, child poverty, which is excluded from the notice of motion before us today. That's why we embarked on that process, so we have a comprehensive approach to, to tackling the issue. And I think, with all due respect, that issue deserves a lot more than the back of an envelope motion before members today, because frankly, that's what we're faced with. I appreciate why this motion was tabled. It was tabled several days before we had our anti-poverty strategy conference. There were no members, obviously, representing the um, non-aligned group at that conference, um, but the motion was obviously circulated to the media, um, along with a press statement, with an offer of a photo opportunity, um, including a person living in poverty and in a damp house. Now, fortunately, the president didn't take up that ambulance chasing approach um, and did reject it and didn't give it the coverage um, that was obviously requested. We, we, we're not here to deal in stunts, leader. We're here to actually come up with a a comprehensive anti-poverty strategy that every single member has a duty, duty to participate in, uh, and therefore I'm happy to second that motion. There's a lot of work taking place already. We need to get on with that work. We need to deliver that strategy in line with the timetable that's been agreed by members. And I think that's what we should be focusing our attention on. Fuel poverty will be an integral part of that strategy. Okay, Rob. Thanks, Leader. Yes, I am... Um we're not quite sure how to follow that, but, um, but returning to the, um, the substance of the motion, I mean, certainly it's an issue I think that everybody um, has sympathy with. Um, I wanted also to propose an amendment. Um, I regret that the timings of business today didn't allow me to afford the mover and second the courtesy of discussing with them beforehand, uh, but they may find it acceptable. Um, it, it uh, I hope, reflects the fact that there is um, a very welcome uh, anti-poverty strategy to be developed, and I think we're looking at July 2015 for that to be um, to be finalised. Although accepting it is a process uh, rather than an event, um, but also highlights one particular issue which uh, I think is relevant in this region, uh, which is the problem uh, of the, the the large number of households who are not on the main gas or mains gas uh, network. Um, very often. Uh, that, um, that that factor is a, a significant contributor towards fuel poverty because reliance on uh, forms of heating, whether that's LPG or um, uh, heating oil or solid fuel, none of these have the social tariffs that are offered by the electricity and gas companies um, or mains gas companies. So the, the amendment is simply uh, to change the final paragraph of the motion um, to read... Uh, the Council will embed the task of addressing fuel poverty and its actions to address poverty and inequality, including giving consideration to how it can lobby for the creation of social tariffs for customers who rely on off-grid fuels for heating, such as heating oil, LPG or solid fuel. And I'd be happy to move that and hope that might be acceptable to the mover and seconder of the motion, if not indeed to everybody. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, I think, you know, that I said in my opening remarks that this is something that uh, people shouldn't be playing politics with. It's something that is important to the Labour group. It's something we take very seriously. And trying to score brainy points with motions and amendments and that is, doesn't do the council any favour at all. It shows us in a bad light, whereas we should be putting our efforts in to actually uh, making a proper anti-poverty strategy available so that we can get people to work together so we can take all aspects of it, not just individual aspects, or cherry pick something that makes a headline one day, but doesn't actually move things forward for every individual in poverty. So I'm, I'm disappointed we are where we are today. We've, we've got a, a strategy that which was agreed by the council. We've got a strategy, move forward anti -for poverty strategy, which takes evidence-based links, uh, you know, it actually works with every partner, third sector partners, uh, others, housing associations, which had a big input in that day, I've got to say, and they're all willing to put effort into it, rather than just picking one, cher cherry picking one item off it, which will do some good for some people, yes, but it's a bigger issue than that. As I said, I'm disappointed at that stage, but anyway, we are. Rob. Thank you, Leader. I, I um, kind of hope you perhaps weren't referring to my efforts to be helpful. Uh, I, I, I was trying to reflect the fact that you have a welcome anti-poverty strategy and simply highlight one specific issue based on my admittedly limited understanding of the nature of the problem, which I thought it might be valuable for the Council to consider as it draws up its strategy. Uh, I, I do trust that that is not a cause for you to be disappointed. Right. Yeah, Chair, uh, as the mover of the motion, I take it that the, you're moving to the vote and I've got the right to reply, is that correct? Yep. Thank you, Chair, and some of the remarks I, I, I don't recognise, it, you know, and I would have hoped that we could have agreed this uh, across the board, uh, all the political parties that are sitting here today. Uh, Chair, I, I did hear you say this was the, 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 the winding up. I see a hand in, uh, so I'll, I'll leave that to you to determine. But I hope we can, uh, and it is not a matter of cherry picking or some of the remarks that have been made already in terms of the disappointment. This is about taking one part of, of the anti-poverty strategy uh, and trying to move this forward. We will not tackle all the poverty, and I did refer to uh, the one in five in Scotland and indeed in areas of Dumfries and Galloway it's one in three uh, children suffering from poverty which are included in the fuel poverty as well suffering uh, those aspects of uh, poverty so in that respect uh, I will leave the, 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 the political playing to others in, in terms of what they have addressed uh, but this was one that came forward we have an issue uh, I have raised it uh, 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 at the senior levels, uh, both in, in terms of the council and uh, with, with the, so the registered landlords. So in that respect here, I think we've got an opportunity to move forward. Happy to sect with the, the support of my seconder, the amendment being moved by the, the, uh, Rob, uh, and to move this forward on the basis that we will be lobbying the Scottish Government to introduce measures to deal with this one, still with the huge issue of uh, dealing with all the poverty issues, including uh, in parts one and three, children suffering from poverty. We've got to be able to move every part of this forward, uh, not on the basis of cherry picking, but how we do it, how we eat that elephant and taking chunks at a time. Jane. Um, thank you, Chairman. I, I will be extremely brief, which is really to say that um, I am in agreement with you um, and the Deputy Leader that this should be taken as a whole, as a strategy. 
I, I, don't, I don't have sufficient information to know whether um, Councillor Davidson's um, proposal is the right thing to do, whether it's sufficient. Uh, I would much prefer to have a look at this in the round. So I will be supporting the Labour motion, Labour amendment. Colin? And, and certainly speaking on behalf of the amendment that I seconded, um, I think it's absolutely clear this council agreed a process for developing anti-poverty strategy. Um, the members in this room who are on the Policy and Resources Committee, including the mover of the motion, um, agreed that strategy and the development process. They agreed the timetable for that. They agreed that all councillors would be able to feed into that process on the issues of fuel poverty and any others that they mish, may wish to, to, to raise. And I raised the point about child poverty, which Councillor Scobie has come back on, but of course isn't actually mentioned in any of the wording of his motion. There is nothing whatsoever to stop Councillor Scobie feeding in um, the comments he's making regarding fuel poverty into the agreed process of this council. There's no point in this council making decisions to undertake a piece of work in partnership with others for councillors to then come along and undermine that process by putting motions before us on just one small aspect of that particular process. Uh, and I have to say, I share your disappointment, Leader. Um, I think developing an anti-poverty strategy is a, a bold step for this council. There's a lot of work being undertaken at the moment. Every single councillor has an opportunity to feed into that process. It doesn't require motions like this before full council today. Okay, uh, we'll get Brian in. Thanks very much, Leader. I would much rather not see the council split in this. I have to say that I do resent some of the remarks made by Councillor Scobie, the inference being that members of this council are not aware of the straits that many people find themselves, the dire straits that many people find themselves in out there, and that this council is doing everything in its power to try to address the problem the best way it can for everybody, whether it be children, whether it be infirm adults, whether it be some measures taken in redressing the balance insofar as on-grid uh, infrastructure is concerned as opposed to LPG and so on and so forth as was mentioned previously by Rob. So I would like this council to find agreement across the, across the chamber and not have to split and go to a vote. Uh, thanks, Leader. Can I, can, uh, I, have a, I have a motion uh, before the Council, it's by Councillor Scobie, seconded by uh, Councillor Forster. Can I just clarify with Councillor Davidson, uh, is he suggesting or proposing that the final paragraph of the Notice of Motion, as before members, be amended to incorporate the words? The Council will embed the task of addressing fuel poverty in its actions to address poverty and inequality, including giving consideration to how it can lobby for the creation of social tariffs for customers who rely on off-grid fuels for heating, such as heating oil, LPG and solid fuel. Is that a substitute for the final paragraph of the motion or is it an addition to the motion? My proposal is a substitute. It's a substitute. Can I just confirm with the mover of the motion that that substitution is acceptable to the mover and the seconder of the motion? Happy to accept that, yeah. That's what I said. So the motion before you is a notice of motion by Councillor Scobie, seconded by Councillor Forster. The final paragraph before members is deleted and the following paragraph is substituted. The Council will embed the task of addressing fuel poverty in its actions to address poverty and inequality, including giving consideration to how it can lobby for the creation of social tariffs for customers who rely on off-grid fuels for heating, such as heating oil, LPG and solid fuel. The amendment, which is by uh, Councillor Thompson, seconded by uh, Councillor Smith, is that this council notes the work that work has already commenced on the development of the first ever anti-poverty strategy for Dumfries and Galloway, and agrees that all members should play an active part in the development of that strategy in line with the clear timetable agreed by the Policy and Resources Committee. Are members ready to go to the vote, Leader? Le Leader. Deputy Leader. Amendment. Councillor Bell. 
Amendment. Councillor Blake. Amendment. Councillor Brady. Amendment. Councillor Ian Carruthers. Amendment. Councillor Cam Carruthers. Amendment. Councillor Carson is no longer with us. Sorry. Councillor Collins. Motion. Councillor Davidson. Motion. Councillor Dempster. Amendment. Councillor Diggle. Amendment. Councillor Drybra. Amendment. Councillor Dykes. Abstain, I wasn't in for that. Councillor Ferguson. Motion. Councillor Forster. Motion. Councillor Geddes. Motion. Councillor Grimm. Amendment. Councillor Yen. Motion. Councillor Hislop. Amendment. Councillor Lever. Amendment. Councillor McCaughtry. Amendment. Councillor McClung. Motion. Councillor McComb. Amendment. Councillor McCutcheon. Amendment. Councillor McGregor. Amendment. Councillor McKee. Amendment. Councillor Maitland. Amendment. Councillor Mayo. Amendment. Councillor Marshall. Amendment. Councillor Martin. Amendment. Councillor Nicholl. Councillor Ogilvy. Amendment. Councillor Peacock. Amendment. Councillor Prentice. Amendment. Councillor Scobie. Motion. Councillor Smith. Amendment. Councillor Stitt. Amendment. Councillor Syme. Amendment. Councillor Tate. Amendment. Councillor Stephen Thompson. Motion. Councillor Tuckfield. Amendment. Councillor Witts. Motion. Councillor Wood. No longer present. Point of order, Chair. My name wasn't called. Sorry, Councillor Dick. My apologies. Councillor Dick. Motion. The amendment is carried by 31 votes to 11 with one abstention. Colin? Leader, can I suggest that the, the various suggestions put forward um, on the fuel poverty motion be fed into that process that, that the Council has already agreed to develop? Agreed. Can I move on to the item uh, 11, which is the rates for approval and voting? No, no, do you take minutes first? Get rid of that. Right, if we can go through these minutes ad hoc, sub review uh, schemes. Give the minute. Happy to second. Did you first management? Happy to move. Happy to second. Education, 25th of November. Happy to move. Happy to second. Employment appeal sub 26th of September. Happy to move. Second. 10th October. Happy to move. Second. 31st of October. Happy to move. Second. 28th of November. Happy to move. Second. License and panel 7th of October. Happy to move. Happy to second. 4th of November. Happy to move. Second. 4th of December. Happy to move. Happy second. Local review by day 8th of October. Pleased to move. Happy to second. 12th of November. Moved. Second. Pension sub 27th of November. Moved. Happy second. Police fire and rescue sub uh, 23rd of October. Up. Second. Policy resources, 18th of November. I'm happy to move. Happy to second. Okay, thank you. Now, if we can now go back to item three, which is the the minute of uh, Thursday, the 25th of September, Thompson Galway Council. Maybe for members' information, uh, go back to to where we started this morning. Uh, leader, I have a motion on the table, which is by yourself, 
uh, seconded by the Deputy Leader, and that is that the minute be accepted as a correct record. Uh, there was discussion regarding the uh, methodology adopted in the appointment of senior councillors. I circulated an email which explains the methodology which is in line with the Council's current practice. I have double-checked the current practice. That is in line with the Council's current practice. We then have an amendment by uh, Councillor Ian Carruthers, seconded by Councillor Bell, and that is that consideration of the minute insofar as relating to paragraph 5 be uh, deferred to enable members to give further consideration. Absolutely. So, glean my own information, a bit further information in regards to making a fully informed decision. Are members asking me to, to, to produce a is, is, is it for me to produce a report explaining the exact methodology, the law behind it, and the standing orders behind it? No, so I, so I can go back. Ask me what I'm not asking you for. I'm asking. I'm asking for time so I can go back and reflect on my notes and my comments. Right. What I was made. So I come back and my, my decision will be fully formed at that point. I don't. Leader, as I explained before, I, I, I'm not sure if you would accept that deferring a, a minute of a council meeting to enable a member to go back and consider their notes uh, would be a competent motion for this council to consider. It could open a very wide can of worms, if that's the right terminology. <laughs> Sorry. I'm looking for further information in regards, not from the, from the governance office, I'm looking for further information. Well, I'll seek it and, and gain myself that, so I can make what I feel is a fully informed decision. I mean, it's as simple as that. Whether it's my notes or whatever it comes to, that's where it's coming. There's a dispute being raised initially by Councillor McClellan in regards to the accuracy of, of, of the, the minute. I, I agree from memory that the, the salary, because we got information straight after the meeting as well in regards to who was salaried and non-salaried, all, all political groups. It's that type of information I want to go back and reflect on. And I mean, I think I agree that this was is a true reflection. The, the decision that was made, I just want to make sure that I'm making, I'm not being bureaucratic, a fully informed decision. Tom. Um, I mean, every member could say they kept a note of a meeting and come back here and say, well, by the way, that's, that's not what my note said, and somebody else says that's what my note said. Either you accept as a councillor, you have a minute there, and you either agree with the minute as it is minuted, or you disagree. The fact that somebody's got something in their memory or got something unnoted is of no consequence and of no bearing. Okay, Jim. Yeah, thanks for letting me back in, Leader. I'd just like clarification on the reasons why my uh, proposed amendment was actually considered by the Governance Officer to be incompetent. Leader, I circulated an email which had gone, which sets out the full, the full decision-making process as adopted by the Council. Uh, I think, looking at the amendment, it accepts a number of nominations and then suggests that they were not appointed as senior councillors. The question in the report was for the appointment of senior councillors. That's what members were asked to do and that's what members have done. The, 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 the fact that they're chairs and vice chairs, quite frankly, in legal terms, is neither here nor there. The report was crafted in such a way as I was seeking authority from the members to pay 14 senior councillors. I got that authority, and you've accepted that is what the report, and that's what the decision of the council was. Okay. Uh, I think in, in, in balance, you know, it's, it's a personal information thing that you're wanting, but, you know, I can't, I can't make that a, a competent... No, uh, I'll remove it later. I mean, okay. Okay, so there's no other uh, motions. Can so I've let you in about three times, Jim. So this is last time. This is the minutes of the meeting. And just because you don't, uh, you, you have different views and it doesn't mean to say you've got to take up the council's time. Yes, I totally agree with that. Uh, as Councillor McCockery brought up the subject of standing orders, standing order 4.5.2 clearly states that the council may elect any other office bearers and senior councillors up to a maximum of 14 as the council sees fit. Therefore, the two notes that the governance officer says was handed to him by yourself and uh, Councillor Hislop uh, privately, the contents of which were not revealed to elected members at the meeting, have no standing in the decision made. So that is not correct. I received from the leader of the council a slate. On the back of that slate, 
were found unfilled posts. Subsequent to the meeting, during the course of the meeting, Councillor Hislop nominated people to those four posts. He then advised me that he accepted that there were only 14 possible people who could get resource and that he gave me a note saying these two people are not to be senior councillors. They are there in the same capacity as Councillor McComb, who was appointed vice chair of Wigton Area Committee. They are unsalaried. We can only pay 14, as I explained in the email which I sent uh, to uh, Councillor Davidson and Councillor Dick. The 14 were clearly indicated by the members as to the 14 who were to be remunerated. The council therefore agreed to pay senior, senior councillor salaries to 14 members, no more, no less. It's accepted that there are vice chairs who are also chairs of committee. They can't receive two salaries. And there are, I think, four vice chairs who do not receive a salary. And that was clearly spelled out to me by the members, by Councillor Hislop and the leader. The process was quite clear. The notes were put round. I have been, I, I'm being honest here, I have been unable to trace the note that Councillor Hislop gave me. I, I did not try to place the councillor behind the eight ball. I will ask the councillor, did you or did you not give me that note with those, that information on it, Councillor Hislop? I gave you the note, Mr. Haswell, um, and I don't have another copy because I had, that was my copy and I gave it to you. Okay, I agree the minute. Thank you very much. I have no other business. Um, uh, have a nice Christmas and a peaceful.